you. So Romans chapter 1, we'll start in verse 1, read down to verse 3. This kind of gives you the context here. And bear in mind, the people that's being, that's being written to, preached to the sermon, this information is, would be Roman Christians. And uh, no doubt there would probably have been Jews in all churches around the world. But you think about Gentiles, and you think, well, what in the world would uh, maybe uh, the connection of David have to do with it? Well, the Holy Spirit certainly feels like it was necessary. So notice it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now notice this is a complete sentence. It was after verse 1, there's a comma. This verse 2, there's a comma. Then notice verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And we're, we're going to stop there because it's kind of a lengthy, in fact, if you go all the way down to verse 7 is where that, that completely ends. So here we have, again, in the New Testament, approximately a thousand years after David would have lived and had his time here on earth. We understand the great promise. We understand what was made to David. We understand that. We understand that people would uh, make much of that as they did uh, even in, in the time of Jesus' life. But here you find the Holy Spirit with this church here, these, these Romans, probably would have been multiple churches. And the point here is making the connection of verse 3. His son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. In other words, in the human sense, human flesh sense, there's David again. Isn't that something? Um, it's very significant for God to have put this in the scriptures. I think it's significant that as new Christians, Ron speaking of new Christians, that no doubt people would try to teach new Christians the word of God, just like if people come here. And we, and we would give uh, books of the Bible, Bible studies just like this, then I'm sure the question would have been, this David you speak of, who was David? Well, he was the first king of Israel. And not the first king, but the, the first really big king, I guess. Saul was the first. But the first one in which the Lord said, from your seed, from your flesh, right on down to the time of Jesus Christ, uh, he will follow this, this bloodline. Now, bear in mind, Jesus at this point is already in heaven, so it's not like Jesus was here on earth and, and it was being brought up. It's after the fact. But I think it's very significant because, it, one, it's, I think it's highlighting the promise. It's keeping that in mind. It's saying that, uh, that Jesus, though he's the son of God in the human sense, he's literally, it's a big deal for him to have come from David. So, I think that's quite significant, especially the group of people that's being written to. All right, notice again, Romans 4, 6. And then I have a psalm there. We won't turn to that, but you could turn to that. But it's basically, it's, it's going back to this psalm. But again, as you get into the book of Romans, lots of doctrine, heavy, heavy on the doctrine, especially uh, showing that everyone was a sinner. Uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3, real heavy on that. But notice what it says here in verse number 6. Uh, it says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God, I'm, I'm sorry, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. And then if you were to go back to Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, here's what it would say basically. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, the whole basis of that, of course, is the fact that it's trying to establish, and especially to these, these Roman Christians, to understand that you're not saved by any works. No one ever has been. In fact, if you go back to, to chapter 3, just go up a few verses, notice uh, verse number 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, that's always been. That's not something that just happened in the New Testament. This idea that people say, well, you got saved differently in the Old Testament than you did the New, that's just not true. That's why the Holy Spirit is using Paul to say, even David was making the point there in verse 6, 7, and 8, that the person that is saved without the works, in other words, one, we're saved because our goodness doesn't take care of our sin anyway, never has. God imputes his righteousness, puts that on our account, makes us righteous by God's righteousness, and even David said that. So this is not some kind of doctrine that was new to uh, the book of Romans or new to the New Testament. 
that's always been the case. Now, some people struggle with that because they, I think this is a good reason why we need to teach things like this. So David, again, is brought up because he's even making the point, even David, the way we would say it, knew this. Even the Holy Spirit told David this is what's important. All right, then notice also in that same book, uh, Romans 11, 9, Romans 11, 9. And again, there's another psalm it refers back to. So notice what it says in verse 9 here. Uh, do I want to go back anymore? Uh, yeah, let's go back to verse 6 here. That, this will help us with the context here. It says, and if by grace, then it is, then it is no more of works. Again, this whole book is, is really about nailing down justification by faith, all right? So it's talking about grace, all right? If it's grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Either grace is grace or it's not. There's not this quasi or, or this, uh, this mixture of grace and works. That's never been the case, and that's why it's making the point that grace will not even be grace if, unless it is all grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Speaking about the, uh, the, the Gentile people. Now, this would especially resonate with a, with, a, with a Gentile Christian, Roman Christian. Notice verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, notice this, let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and bow down their neck always. And we could go on to kind of, but the point is, is again, here's the Holy Spirit bringing David back up to, to make a point that's not some new point, but a point, it's, it's the character of God, and basically it's saying, look, the Jewish people had their opportunity as a whole. But that being said, it wasn't all Jewish people that rejected Jesus. Obviously some did, and David was even saying, even in his day, there's going to be people that would have believed and trusted, and some that didn't, whether they were Jew or Gentile. But the point is, David is being brought up here. Why? Because uh, it's trying to make the point that, that God's character has always been his character. But here's just a different situation in which uh, the Jewish people seemingly here, uh, from anybody's standpoint, have kind of been put on the back burner. The Gentiles have been brought uh, in, into light with the gospel. We can spend a lot of time with that, but the point I'm making is it's interesting how David here, again, becomes a, a way to make the point. All right, now turn over to 2 Timothy 2.8, 2 Timothy 2.8, about halfway finished already, 2 Timothy 2.8, this would have been the young preacher that Paul especially is, is, um, is helping like many, but I think many believe that when Paul passed off the scene, Timothy was probably what we would call kind of the human replacement, if you please, someone that people would really have looked to, he obviously would have known Paul very well. And that would have helped a lot. So notice here then, uh, verse 8, let's see here. Uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just go there. I don't want to get too far back. It's just too much time to explain all the things it's speaking of. But notice how it, it mentions this here. It says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now imagine if we just took out of the seed of David and just took that out, it would not change the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, obviously. But it's not just making the point that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's not even just making the point, as he said, my gospel. Remember that Jesus Christ, why is this significant, of the seed of David was raised from the dead. Isn't that interesting that the Holy Spirit made it a point to say, look, here's the connection again, David. Again, promises that were given to David, uh, the, the, the promise that this eternal kingdom, and it kind of began with David, if you please. It's, in, it's almost like if we didn't know that Jesus uh, is and was God, anybody hearing the conversation would have thought, well, it's interesting how this person is connected to this, this major figure called David. And yet, David, you can imagine, even as it was said, that my Lord said unto my Lord, here's David, king of the land, and yet he knows who Almighty God is. He knows, he knows who the Lord is. 
And yet here it is speaking that one day of your seed, David, would come the Lord in the human sense. So it's almost like, it would be like, man, how do you wrap your mind around this? And yet here we have this young Timothy trying to help, and, and Paul helping young Timothy be the preacher and preach the doctrines that were supposed to be preached. And here we have this idea that, again, this Jesus Christ of the seed of David. All right, then notice we've got two references in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 7. Now, Hebrews is heavy, heavy, heavy about trying to get the Jews to realize there are things that, yeah, were important, but they were pictures. They were pictures of Christ and pictures of a, in a way, a better way, if you please. Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, better than animals and so on. All right, so notice Hebrews 4, 7. Uh, let's go back to verse 1. This kind of helps because here's a, this is an interesting doctrine here that, that, that comes up. Um, let's go back to chapter 3, verse 18, because I want to show you, I want to pull in this word rest in here, because here becomes the subject of Jesus and rest. It says, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So here you go. There's this thing, it's kind of like... Uh, uh, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and that sort of thing. You know, this idea of, of struggling, even as a child of God, but also people that would struggle not realizing that Jesus, everything is him. He is kind of our rest, if you please. It's kind of like if, you, if someone is, is constantly trying to work to be saved, and they realize you've got to believe on Jesus. Imagine the rest that comes from somebody. I'm sure there's people in this room, people that struggle with getting saved and fought it. Remember the day you got saved, you said, boy, it was like a, it was like a, a, a weight was taken off your shoulders. Uh, there's something about that. You know why? Because Jesus gives rest in many ways, and certainly the reason why his people, especially in the wilderness, were in such a uh, push-down situation, if you please, is because of their unbelief. They could have had rest. Look. They could have had rest, literally, from 40 years of wandering. They could have had 40 years um, uh, from the death that uh, all those adult men had to experience. And certainly the, the women, because just by natural course of age, they died too. So really only two men went in of that generation, Joshua and Caleb. But this idea of rest, all right, notice verse 1 of chapter 4. Let us therefore fear. That means we ought, there ought to be something that would bother us, Christians, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. So this is the same thing. It's, it's kind of like we've been talking about going into our promised land. Uh, the promised land, a lot of songwriters, bless their heart, tried to picture the promised land is going to heaven one day. Well, look, Canaan land was not like a picture in heaven. That's picturing uh, the promises. It's picturing usefulness for God. Heaven is heaven. This idea of not entering to, into rest and, and, and not getting the promises, that's what's being spoken of here. It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about us not, not taking advantage and getting something because uh, we don't take advantage of, of the promise. All right, notice verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest as he said. As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So you're talking about this salvation event. All right, look at verse 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day. This is interesting. On this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Now you're talking about this idea of resting from works. It's really getting down to the people that would not believe and trust and this idea of works, all right? Notice verse 5. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. That's going into the promise, and they wouldn't believe, so they did not get what God had for them, all right? Now notice verse 7, how it brings David into this. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased 
from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. The whole point of this is about the trust in God. Obviously, salvation, that's important. It's also important that we trust God, that God has things for us. Interesting how David is brought into the picture once again. All right. Then notice, uh, let's see here, uh, chapter 11, verse 32. Chapter 11, verse 32. Now, many of you know there's a great listing of people, what we call the Hall of Faith. Someone gave it that title. You get down to verse number 31, and then it jumps into a whole bunch of people in which David is put in that, is in that group. It says, by faith, in verse 31, the harlot Rahab perished not, with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace, all right? So you, you see this listing, of course, you know, you got Moses in here, you got Rahab, and then you think, okay, there's a lot more people that follow her. Now notice verse 32, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, he was one of the judges, of Bar Barak, he was a judge, of Samson, he was a judge, Jephthah, he was a judge. So that's the book of Judges, all right? Then you've got the book of Ruth, which is the period of the Judges. And then you're going to go into First and Second Samuel, which you start getting into the era of David. All right, so then you notice it mentions um, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. And then you don't have anybody's name mentioned anymore after that. So it's interesting here that a lot of time was devoted to Moses, but it does, it does mention David. But again, here's David's name again being mentioned. Now, the last three are pretty significant here. So this is the book of Revelation. So turn to chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7. And you've got these seven churches. Okay, so we're just going to look at the one that mentions David here. All right. So it ends with uh, the church there at Sardis, and then it comes to the church of Philadelphia. No doubt our city of Philadelphia was named after this location here. So notice what it says here in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. Isn't it interesting? Of all the seven churches, the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Um, We'll go ahead and read this because there's not a lot said about each of these churches. But, but, but think about the church and this idea that David, uh, uh, rather Jesus, would introduce himself as uh, who he is, of course, and the key of David. All right, so he mentions there in verse 7 about the opening and the shutting. All right, notice verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews. Now that's interesting here, because it mentions in verse 7 the key of David. Then you've got these folks who say, hey, we're Jews. We're Jews, all right? And are not. Interesting. But do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God, notice this, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Then there's the next church. So here you have basically three references that have something to do with, you've got David, you've got people that say they're Jews and they're not, and then it talks about this temple here, which that's not unusual, but then it mentions the New Jerusalem. This church didn't have any negatives against it. You know, some of the churches, they needed to fix it, or God says, I'm going to come in there and remove the candlestick. This particular church says you've got a little strength in verse 8, so you're, we would use some, you're hanging in there. 
And he says, look, I've set before you an open door. Doors are meant to go through. You're not, you don't gaze at a door. He says, look, I've, I've got a door for you. It's open, and nobody's going to shut that door. Whatever all that meant, he says, look, there's your door, and, uh, which means you need to go through it. And no one's going to keep you from going through it. The only one that would keep you going through that door is who? Us. Now, there's something about that. Now, you take a church, any church, but you take a church that says, you know what, we're, we're doing what we think is right. And uh, we understand what we think is right. We're hanging in there, but it seems like, boy, it's like a battle. Uh, we've got to be patient. You know what? Well, that sounds a lot like Woodlawn Baptist Church as far as I'm concerned. Huh? D does it not? Unless we're so off base, we're so, we're so out of it, we have no clue that we're, we're, we're like Martians or something. But I don't believe that. I don't believe that for one minute. This church, by the way, existed at the same time that the other churches existed. And uh, so here's a church. The Lord says, look, I know what's going on here. But he, but he addressed this. Every church was addressed by a little different characteristic of who Jesus was. And in this case, he says here, he says, he that is holy, speaking of himself, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David. Now, I don't know exactly what all that key of David is, but the fact that David is mentioned here and the fact that some people said we're Jews, and then he says there's going to come this new Jerusalem, and, uh, and it's going to come down. Uh, this, this church may very well have had more, perhaps, uh, Jewish believers in it, though it was in Asia Minor. That's not that important. The thing I've got to look at it is this. The Lord says, I hold the key. He says, you don't have the key, I've got the key. And when there's a door that's shut, the Lord says, I can open any door with this because I have the key of David. And by the way, when you think about the key of David, it sounds like, because we know by the time Revelation is written, you know, it, it's speaking much about the coming kingdom. And a king that will come, this will be King Jesus. So it sounds like to me, even though this church existed a long time ago, and to this date, uh, I don't know if anybody knows exactly the location, doesn't matter, but always say, the Lord did promise that every church would have its divine protection. Why then, why then, any church would just suddenly no longer be? Now, we obviously know that people live and die. I get that. But if a church is doing what it's supposed to do, then it's obviously going to be reaching people that will be younger than themselves and have families just like these kids back here. We pray, and Grandma certainly prays, that these kids are going to live for God when they get to be uh, a, an adult and when they get to be our age, that they're going to be sitting on a pew and no doubt have somebody that they're influencing just like Grandma is to these kids. Now, let me tell you something. The devil doesn't shut down churches. The one who has the key does. Okay? And the Lord says, look, I've got a door for you. And no man, look, look at the phrase here again. To me, this is such a blessing. He says, he that openeth and no man shutteth. That means when God opens a door, there, there's no excuse to say, well, that, that's going to be shut by somebody. No, it's not. No man can shut that door. And here's a sad thing, though, and shutteth and no man openeth. That reminds me that when the, the rain started falling and the ark started lifting, you can imagine the people saying, oh, you remember that, 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 that Noah, he told us about something like this. You know what? They couldn't have gotten in that ark if, if they'd have had a, a sawzall and cut the sides out of it. God says, you're not going to get in this thing. I've shut the door. And uh, to me, I would, always, I would always shudder to think that if there's an opportunity that we had as a church, I had as a preacher, you have as an individual, that God had a door open, and we refused to go through that door. You know why? Because God says, look, here, church, if you listen to me, i got a door for you. Now, you go through that door. you got a little strength. Now, use what strength you have and do this. And he says, you've kept my patience. That means, obviously, there are people that were trying. Look, any church that's going to do anything for God is going to have the forces of hell and anything else trying to keep it from doing God's bidding. But you know what, you've got, to, you've, got, you've, got to, you've got to take what God has given you and, give, and, and let us have an open door. I'll say this, as long as the authorities are not trying to shut us down, we got an open door at Woodlawn Baptist Church. Hey, when we start complaining, when they start saying you can't have church and we start moaning and groaning, listen to me. And we didn't, and we didn't do everything we could to keep the doors open, which means out here being a witness for Jesus and doing everything. Uh, it's, it's too late to start moaning and groaning when there's things we can do. We've got an opportunity to win the loss right now. You hear me? There's no law that says you can't pass out anything. Look, I, there was a blessing. Let me share this with you. We were eating down in uh, Thomasville. 
at a restaurant. And we were sitting there, and a man, I, we saw him outside. He was talking to somebody. I didn't know what he was doing, to be honest with you. And then he came inside. He started going from table to table to table. You know what he was doing? Passing out gospel tracts. And I, I'm sure he's probably done that before because he, was, he was, wasn't being quiet. He wasn't sneaky about it. He was saying, God bless you. I got a tract for you. And, of course, we said, hey, we got something for you, too. We pulled ours out. We kind of, you know, we have kind of like dueling uh, banjos. We was doing dueling tracks. He went, and then and then and then and then and We went, and then and then and then and then we started doing a little, little. You're crazy, preacher. Yeah, that, that's probably not the right illustration there. But anyway, we got an opportunity. We got a door. We better be using it. And God was reminding this church. He says, "Look, I don't have any negatives against you, but I tell you what, the only negative would have been go through the door you have there." So. But he mentions the key of David. Isn't that interesting? The key of David. All right, then notice chapter 5, verse 5. We're hurrying up here. Quarter till. We're not in any rush. You say, Preacher, why you act like you're so rushed? Ah, maybe the devil's telling me that kind of stuff. I don't know. But then again, maybe not. Uh, all right, look at verse 3. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, nor neither to look thereon. And I wept much. This is John speaking. Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, I love these titles here, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Now that's Jesus, but notice what it says next. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And, of course, we know this is Jesus. The, isn't it interesting that in heaven, during this vision here that John was seeing, that one of the elders said, look, there's nobody can open this particular book, but there is one. He says, don't you weep. There is one that can do this. And he says, the lion of the tribe of Judah. We're talking about an old member of Judah is one of the, one of the, one of the uh, sons of Jacob. It goes way back, Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Speaking of Jesus, because that's the tribe he was from, the tribe that, that David was from. And it literally says the root of David. Wow. That's telling me that uh, God, when he says something, boy, he, he don't forget it, number one. It's almost like God, when he established that covenant, even before him thinking about it. Can you imagine the, the Lord seeing David as a little child saying, boy, this boy's going to grow up. He has no clue what he's going to be. He probably thinks all he'll ever do is be a little shepherd boy, which he was probably content, content to be with that. He probably thought, man, my day will be great if I, can, if I can deliver my sheep or protect my sheep from the lion and from the bear. And that's probably all he cared about because I think, one, I think he was out there really close to God. But God had, God had something big for him, and we know that. But here we find the Lord, and of all the people in, in the entire universe, uh, anywhere, only one could open the book, and the title given to him is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and then it says the Root of David. Wow. Then turn to the very last chapter of the book. Amazing how it ends this way, chapter 22, verse 16. Five verses from the very end of the book of all books. And notice who gets mentioned here. So Revelation 22, 16. Um, let's go ahead and start at verse 12 because this is where he's speaking. And we're about finished anyway. It's always good when you're at the very end of a book like that because a preacher can't unless he starts going backwards, and I'm not going to do that. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Remember I've told you that my reward is with me to give every man according as, as his work shall be. Now, we know that's not salvation, but it is our service. I'm going to tell you something. You keep working, working, working for the Lord, whatever that is, and God says, I, got, I can't wait to give my rewards out. I can't wait to do this. Verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega. That's the... That's the A of the Greek alphabet, and, and the omega is the Z. That's the, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. That's all unbelievers there. And look what a, what a description of those people. 
And then notice verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Now, who's that angel? Who was that angel? Well, who was the angel? He says, I, I've sent him to, to, to the seven churches. Who is that? Huh? Who? No, it ain't me. I didn't live back then, Christy. Now, if we, if we can't get past this, then I feel like I'm a big failure up here. Jesus says, I sent my angel to tell you churches those letters. Who was it sent by, folks? John, 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 John. Yeah, it wasn't Gabriel or Michael. We, I think some people see that and go, oh, some angel came to church. Wow, I bet they really paid attention. No, it was John. And by the way, an old man, John. An old man. In fact, some of the people have not even known who he was. Have you ever, uh, I don't want to be depressing here, but have you ever known people who's lived so long that you feel like nobody knows me because everybody I've known is either dead or these people back here don't know me. Well, I bet, I bet John probably felt a little bit like that. You know why? They say he lived to be 90 years of age. Now, he, he, supposedly they were going to bull him an old one time. That's not in the Bible, but, but, but history seems to say, okay, they tried to get him there, and he, he got through that one. They banish him to the Isle of Patmos, which is where he gets these from, and they go back and find him. They say he was there four years and figure, well, this man will be dead. He's not going to live. They just dropped you off on an island, and, you know, good luck, and, you know, we'll probably never see you again. You'll die, and maybe and you'll just end up in the shore, and, you know, the world will never know you hardly existed. Well, they went back and got John. History says he went back to the church at Ephesus and may have even been the pastor of the big, large church at Ephesus, which obviously is uh, mentioned here in Revelations 2 and 3. So here's my point. Here's Jesus as I've sent mine angel to testify. You know who that is? That's John. Of these things in the churches. And notice what he says. Here's, the, here's this description. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say come. And let him that heareth say come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. You talk about one of the last things said in the Bible. This ought to be our attitude. We've got something to give that's so mighty and so powerful and so free. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Oh, boy, that'd be terrible, wouldn't it? And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, literally, specifically, Revelation, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things says, Surely I come quickly, amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. Now, that's the last thing, and that, 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 that ends what we call the Bible, the canon, C-A-N-O-N, of the Scriptures. And yet Jesus, out of all the things that he says at the very end, as far as a title or any association about himself, is, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The bright morning star, I get that one. Well, that's, you know, that's, that glorious, a star, that, that celestial being. But he says, I am the root and the offspring of David. Sounds like to me when God made a promise to David and says, look, this thing is going to come to pass, and David, you are just but a mortal man. And David made the mistakes he's made like, like many of us and then some that we would never do, probably, especially the murder part. But the point is, why would God keep making and, and close a book and mention the fact that he is the root and the offspring of David. Well, I'll say this. You know, this, this book in context was written to seven churches. Now, of course, we, we look at it and everybody that's ever lived has, has studied and, and has preached from Revelation. I get that. There are seven churches. But you remember that one Ephesus, which, which history says they believe John went back there and died uh, as an old man. And probably because he was old, he's the last of the apostles. You can imagine being the last one left from something and people really being intrigued about what was it like. Remember, imagine him saying, what was it like to, to walk with Jesus? Imagine him taking the time. Well, let me tell you. And he would tell things that's not even in the Bible about Jesus. 
He was the one who leaned upon the breast of Jesus. He was the one that took care. Uh, how, uh, people say that you took care of Mary, his mother. I did. And probably, probably, he outlived her. But the point is, here's, this, here's, this, here's, here's David, and you've got John speaking of David. And it's interesting to me, though, of these seven churches here, though, that the one that uh, maybe had almost the harshest criticism, at least the language was, he told the church at Ephesus, you've left your first love. Repent. Repent because you've left your first love. Paraphrase, you're good at seeing the evil and, and what's wrong, but you've left your first love. Now come back to where we started out with David. Why was David selected anyway in this big covenant? I think I'm right on, well, I'll put it this way. We know that David was selected to be king even before Saul was even dead. And the description we have of David is he was a man after God's own heart. It was his love. 